Okay, we're back again for our next chapter of what? Chaplains and Clergy of the Revolution. And I am so excited, kids, that uh, we are jumping back into this chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters. And it's one of my favorite chapters because it's about one of my favorite people. When I talk about people that absolutely understand the extensibility of the gospel and pastors and teachers that were very, very involved in the whole aspect of life. This is one of my favorite examples of that type of person who knows the extensibility of the gospel, knows what it means to actually become super involved in, in those things that matter and, uh, you know, it's uh, just a, a number of exciting things. And also, someone that understood what it means when we talk about assimilating into this country. And that assimilation was even before it was uh, included into what became then our nation and constitution. So with that introduction, I want to get into chapter 28. Chapter 28. John Witherspoon, Doctor of Divinity, D.D. So here's what's going to be in this chapter. Very, very interesting. The clergy as statesman. Witherspoon, a Scotsman by birth, his early life, is licensed to preach, joins the army on the pretender, taken prisoner at the Battle of Falkirk. His eminence as a theologian, is elected president of Princeton College. Flattering reception in his country. Takes sides with the colonies. Elected member of the New Jersey legislature. Scathing attack of Governor Franklin. That was Benjamin Franklin's son. Elected member of Congress. His speech on the Declaration of Independence his great service in Congress, and his death. So, here we go. Are you ready? <clears throat> the clergy of the country were found not only in the pulpit and field upholding the cause of the American colonies and in the ranks fighting for it, but also in the councils of the nation leading both the sanction of their office and the ripened fruit of long years of study to promote its success. Foremost among these was Dr. Witherspoon, a Scotsman by birth, but in every other respect, an American patriot. He was born in Yester, near Edinburgh, in 1722. Licensed to preach when scarcely of age, he, in 1744, was presented with the parish of Bythe by the Earl of Ellington. A short time after he was ordained, the pretender landed in the north of Scotland, and the Highlanders rallying with enthusiasm to his standard, he moved southward. Carried away by the general enthusiasm, young Witherspoon raised a corps of militia, and putting himself at its head, marched to Glasgow. Wow. Right there, i got to stop a minute. So here, here's a pastor that was enthused about what was happening politically in his native country and raised up a corps of militia, and he was the head of it. He was taken prisoner on the battle, at the Battle of Falkirk and confined in the castle of Donay, where he remained till after the terrible overthrow of the pretender at the Battle of Culloden. He was then released and returned to his ministerial labors. He soon rose to eminence in his native country, and his fame having reached this side of the water, he was elected president of Princeton. Embarking in May 1768, he after a long voyage, reached Philadelphia, where he was received with great honor. His arrival, his arrival at Princeton was celebrated by an illumination of the college and town, and the whole province shared in the general joy felt at the 
ascension of such a man to its seat of learning. Inaugurated president in August, he devoted himself with his accustomed energy to the duties of his position, and soon gave a new impetus to the cause of learning in the country, and elevated to a high, higher rank at home and abroad the character of the college. He threw himself with his accustomed ardor into the contest between the colonies and the mother country, and at once took the position of leader of the patriots in New Jersey, which he ever after maintained. When Congress appointed a day of fasting and prayer in May 1776, Dr. Witherspoon preached a discourse entitled, quote, The Dominion of Providence Over the Passions of Men, end quote in which he went thoroughly into the great political question of the day. The sermon being published, it was received with warm uh, acumens in America, but denounced in Scotland, where it was republished with notes, and the author stigmatized as a rebel and traitor. A few days after its delivery, the Provincial Congress of New Jersey met, and Witherspoon, who had been elected a member, took his seat in it. Among the first acts was the passage of an order requiring the governor to present himself before it to answer for his conduct in opposing the action of the colonists. He came and, being escorted into the hall by a military guard, assumed a haughty, overbearing demeanor, and refusing to answer any questions that were put to him, told the representatives of the people that they, that they were an illegal assembly, ignorant, low-bred men, wholly unfit and unable to devise any measures for the pure good and deserve to be hung as rebels. I have to stop there. So in this present day of 2019, and if this lives into posterity, that's exactly what the Democrats and the Socialists and the Communists in America were saying about myself, Donald Trump, and all of us who are true patriots. They said we're unfit, unable to devise any measures for public good. I mean, they're nasty, nasty. So the nastiness is always with those who portray evil. So continuing, Witherspoon fixed his keen eye upon him, and listened in suppressed scorn and indignation to his vulgar, insolent triad, and the moment he closed, sprang to his feet, and unbolting the stores of irony and sarcasm that had been rapidly fi filling, poured on the astonished representative of the king a rebuke so withering that the boldest held his breath in astonishment. He coolly reminded the governor of his illegitimate origin and the early neglect of his education and well-known ignorance of all scientific and liberal knowledge to show with how little propriety he could denounce them as ignorant, incapable men and concluded by saying in his tone of bitterest sarcasm, quote, on the whole... Mr. President, I think that Governor Franklin has made us a speech every way worthy of his exalted birth and refined education. End quote. When the vote was finally taken on deposing the governor, his decided eye left no doubt of the course he meant to pursue. The day after this high handed act, he was elected with five others to represent New Jersey in the Continental Congress. He joined it a few days before the Declaration of Independence, and among the lofty intellects assembled in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, he was among the first. No doubt or vacillation marked his course. Intrepid, resolute, and far-seeing, he gave the whole weight of his influence to the side of complete independence. When the Declaration was reported and laid before Congress for their adoption and signature, 
Everyone felt that a fearful crisis had come. Some true patriots wavered. The step which should forever separate them entirely from the mother country and plunge the land, plunge the land in a war, the end of which no man could foresee, was a momentous one to take. But the hour of decision had arrived, and not only the fate of a great nation, but of man, the world over, hung suspended on it. That august body felt the tremendous responsibility that rested upon it, and a deep and solemn silence reigned throughout the hall. In the midst of it, Witherspoon arose and said, quote, Mr. President, that noble instrument on your table, which ensures immortality to its author, should be subscribed this very morning by every pen in the house. He who will not respond to its assent and strain every nerve to carry it into effect its provisions is unworthy the name of Freeman. Although these gray hairs must descend into the sepulcher, I would infinitely rather they should descend thither by the hand of the executioner than desert at this crisis the sacred cause of my country. End quote. The venerable man sat down, but those great words continued to vibrate in each heart, strengthening the firm and giving courage to the wavering. And when a timid member remarked that the country was not ripe for such a declaration of independence, Witherspoon replied in a voice that rung through the hall, quote, In my judgment, sir, we are not only ripe, but rotten, end quote. With an untremulous hand and a heart firm and steady, he put his name to that immortal instrument. He continued a member of Congress for six years and became identified with some of the most important measures adopted by that body. He was a member of the Secret Committee and the Board of War and one of the most active men in the various committees to which he was appointed. He made a report to Congress of the cruel treatment of prisoners by the British in New York and helped prepare a protest on the subject. He was sent also to the headquarters of the Army to improve the condition of the troops and was constantly employed in devising measures for the welfare of the colonies. Although a member of Congress, he never laid aside his ministerial character but preached on the Sabbath and always wore his clerical robes in Congress during its sitting. I have to stop. So he always represented his ministerial duties. It, that's just amazing. Just amazing. Well, I'll tell you what, kids, this is just continues always to be something amazing to me. In, in respect to Witherspoon. And he just, it always stymies me that today many, many pastors have no idea of these truths of Witherspoon, or if they do, they just poo-poo them. I, I don't get it. But anyway, we're talking about Witherspoon here. And just, I want to reiterate that he always wore his clerical robes in Congress during its sitting. And continuing... He wrote most of the congressional address to the country recommending fast, etc. His, quote, thoughts on American liberty, end quote, and his speeches in Congress against the prodigal issues of paper money and other state papers are well known and can only be referred to here. In the darkest hour, his courage never faltered, for to a high, heroic spirit, he added an unwavering trust in God and a belief that he would eventually enable us to triumph. Far-seeing and sagacious, he seemed to anticipate evils that escaped the observation of others and provided against them. When Thomas Paine, though in the fresh popularity of his, quote, crisis, was proposed as secretary to the Committee of Foreign Affairs, he strenuously opposed his appointment, not deeming him, he said, a safe man for the office. So also, 
when Wilkinson made his tardy appearance at the floor of Congress with the standard sent to it by General Gates, and a member moved that the bearer be voted a costly sword for his services, he, seeing through all this delay and uh, penetrating the contemplatable, the contemptible, excuse me, the contemptible design of him and Gates that afterward assumed more definite shape to unseat Washington as commander-in-chief arose and with an emphasis and tone that pierced like a dagger proposed in place of a sword that the messenger should be, quote, rewarded with a pair of golden spurs, end quote. It is impossible in a short sketch to give in detail a history of his career in Congress. It is enough to say that at the time it was the most august body of men that ever sat in deliberation over the fate of a free people. He, in intellect, integrity, and influence, ranked among the first. And at a latter period, when it became degraded to a miserable cabal, the hotbed of conspiracies and the fountain of all mischief, he stood, quote, faithful among the faithless, end quote. One of the few noble columns that towered unshaken amid the disorders and turbulence that for a time threatened to make that body a hissing and byword in the nation. While it is well for the reputation of many that composed it and for that of the country at large that the journal for a long period was destroyed, it is a pity that, for such as he and a few others, it was not preserved to show their integrity and patriotism in every trial and temptation. With a presence like that of Washington that commanded respect and awe, whenever he arose to address Congress, every eye was turned upon him. His sarcasm was withering, and the boldness winced under it. The boldest winced. That means the boldest person winced under it. Okay. While he possessed a power in argument and a persuasive eloquence with which nothing could withstand, and that made him the bulwark of liberty to the last, his duties as a clergyman and those of a legislator he performed with the same conscientiousness, and in them felt he was equally doing God's service. He died the 15th of November, 1794, in full possession of his faculties and in calm, sublime trust in the Savior. He was a voluminous writer, an active worker to the last. An edition of his works, comprising three octavo volumes, was published in 1803 in Philadelphia, under the supervision of Reverend Dr. Green, and one of nine volumes, Dumadesio, excuse me, Duom, my Latin is really rusty, and at least nine volumes was republished in Edinburgh in 1815. In the pulpit of America, if the pulpit of America had given only this one man to the revolution, it would deserve to be held in everlasting remembrance for the service it rendered the country. There's so much more that I could talk about on John Witherspoon. I, I, I have all of his volumes, and I've been reading him extensively over the years. Uh, he, just amazing writings. Uh, he was, without question, that contemporary of uh, Samuel Adams, and he lived longer than Samuel Adams. As we can tell by his age, Samuel Adams was a, a bit older than he. And that uh, the fact is, is that they, they were, when you, when you read what you can, and have, as I've taken you through things, he and Sam Adams were really sometimes the only two people that were left uh, when Congress went home or all these other insanities were happening, that they were true Christian patriots that uh, were bulwarks of what kept the battle going and the intellect inside of Congress moving forward. They truly 
uh, were two men that were peas in a pod in, in my estimation. So when you look at John Witherspoon, there is a lot to read on him. Uh, there, there's just so much on uh, morality and governance and truth and all of those things. And, and the fact and reality was he was the tutor of Madison. He was the tutor of so many political leaders and justices and, and, and men of great renown. So... Uh, if there's one person that I would encourage as someone to look at as a pastor, as a true patriot, as an intellect, I raise my hand and say uh, John Witherspoon was right at the top of any list. So with that, we'll get ready to get on to chapter 29, David Avery. <laughs>